Okay, so today we will be talking about Tomi, which is my second Junji Ito book. My first one was Uzumaki, and I have so many thoughts. <laughs> we'll keep it spoiler free at first, and then we'll get into some spoilers. So Tomi is a story about a femme fatale character who, um, she is a teenage girl who is extremely beautiful and young men, when they see her, when they interact with her, when they speak with her, they oftentimes usually will be so enraptured by her that they kind of have this obsession toward her. And she will usually drive them to the point of murder. Usually she's the victim. Usually her, the, the men that fall for her end up killing her. So with Uzumaki, the big theme was obsession. Obsession, that, well, the big theme was spirals, but people were seeing spirals and the spir spirals were drop, driving them to this obsession that ended up making them lose their sanity. And with Tomie, it's similar in that it's a person this time that is driving people into this deep obsession that turns into kind of like a stalker scenario where somebody is so obsessed with someone that they end up killing them, which I don't quite understand, but I know it's a real thing. Tomie is a really interesting story because it's it's one that I feel like has, while it, like Uzumaki, feels like many different um, ideas, many different, it's, it's the same thread, but it's just a lot of different stories of that thread being told in different ways. It also, I think from the beginning has a pretty clear, uh, connection between the stories. Whereas with Uzumaki, I felt it, it felt very disjointed to me until I got to the end and it all came together and it was so satisfying. And with Tomie, I felt like I could see a lot of connections from the very start. So it was really easy to get me extremely invested extremely early on. Not only that, but Junji Ito's writing his storytelling, I think, is so phenomenal, um, especially with Tomie, where, you know, the, the beginning chapter is extreme and intense, but we're still in spoiler free, so I, I don't even want to talk about that in any kind of detail. But it's also, it also leaves a lot of, okay, what does that mean? And the more we read these chapters, we're getting just piece by piece little information on Tomie, the character, on her limitations, on what her motivation is and how she affects people and the extent that she'll go. And there's a lot of things, there were a lot of things in the beginning where I felt like, okay, if we're adding this to the story, if this is now an element, then that opens the door to a lot of things. That leaves us with implications that that must mean that this, this, and this is also true. So you better fulfill that Junji Ito because otherwise it's going to be a big plot hole. And there were so many things like that where I found myself treating, especially the first half of this book, I found myself treating it almost like a mystery because Junji Ito would very slowly parse out information about Tomie in these really organic ways as I'm just watching her interact with different people and with the world in different ways and seeing the way she responds to certain things and seeing the way people respond to her. And it left me leaving a bunch of sticky notes where I'm just trying to piece things together and say, okay, well, this connects to that. So that must mean that this is the thing that causes X, Y, and Z. And I was able to piece together a lot of things before the narrative finally delivered the answer because there were so many hints and clues about Tomi, Tomie's um, limitations about what provokes her about things. And rather than just kind of presenting me with this character and then having her be pure evil or having her do X, Y, and Z, and it just is a story that I follow, instead he chose to parse out information slowly slowly that made me really interact with the story because I was trying to solve, I was trying to understand Tomie on a much deeper level, which was really satisfying when those things would then be confirmed. And I'm like, yes, yes, he left me the clues and I found them, you know what I mean? It's funny because for the first half of this book, for sure, I felt like I enjoyed Tomie even more than I enjoyed Uzumaki. And for the first half of the book, and maybe even the first two thirds of the book, I was like, okay, this is my new 
favorite Junji Ito. It's only my second one, but this this goes, this is better than Uzumaki for me. I don't feel that way now that I finished it. I actually don't know which one I love more because I do think that that last third of the book dropped off for me. I'll say that while there is a very distinct thread with Tomie, with her actions and with how she changes throughout the story, and I loved what Junji Ito did with her character, and I loved that thread and those connections so much, um, with, with Uzumaki, I felt like each chapter felt like uh, almost like a short story in and of itself, and I didn't really see uh, I didn't see a, th a narrative thread. It just felt like, here's some different ways spirals affect people, but then by the end, it was the end when it all came together and when it all felt intentional, and that was what really blew me away. Whereas with, with Tomie, the main thread was so good, and then I just didn't, I, I expected the ending of Tomie to also come together and have a really strong narrative punch at the end, and I didn't think it did. Maybe I missed something and y'all in the spoiler section can help me, but I didn't think it did. At least not to the level that I wanted it to. With that said, even with that being true, I still absolutely love the story. I had so much fun reading it. I highly recommend it, and I, I would read this again, absolutely. It, even though the ending wasn't what I expected it to be, I'm still thrilled that I read it. Speaking of the artwork, Briefly, I was, it was very jarring to go from Uzumaki to Tomie because the beginning of Tomie was a big step down in quality. So I believe the beginning of Tomie was written long before Uzumaki and it was told over a long period of time. And you can see a really strong change in the artwork. Not very, it doesn't take very long to get to that. It's probably, I don't know, five, six chapters in. It starts out in what is my opinion, much better than I could draw, but not amazing and quickly turns into the horrific beauty that I got from Uzumaki. So, you know, if the art style at the beginning throws you off, don't worry, it's incredible for most of the book. Okay, let's get into some spoilers. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in spoilers, hopefully, um, but if you don't want spoilers, just go to the description of this video, click on final thoughts, and you can join us at the end. For spoilers, ooh, so the beginning of the story seems like is the beginning of turning Tomie into a monster. Her teacher preys on her, I'll put it that way. She may seem like the instigator, but she's still a child and I... Mm. Anyway, it's revealed that she is sleeping with her teacher, but her teacher is kind of reacting to her the same way men react to her throughout this entire novel, really. But her teacher is kind of acting uh, the same way most of the men in this novel react, or at least a lot of men in this novel react, where it's a clear repulsion, yet an inability to stay away. Anyway, she gets killed, they decide to chop her up, which I think fits really well with the themes of this book, because she ca she causes this intensity and this insanity out of people that are are in her grips with people that are affected by her. She, she, she creates this, this, this extremism that ordinarily people wouldn't feel around her. So I don't necessarily think, I don't know, I don't know. I don't necessarily think that chapter one is like the origin of who Tomi becomes. I do think that she had some sort of draw on the characters even in chapter one. Otherwise, the characters in chapter one are acting ludicrous to to jump to such extremes as an entire class full of people cutting her up and hiding her body parts all over each of them and choosing to stay quiet and all saying, well, she sucks, she deserved it. All of the reactions out of them seem too abnormal for her to not already have something on her that causes people to turn into these obs extreme obsessive and violent people like throughout the rest of the novel. But you do see at the beginning where she's kind of like taking revenge on the people that did this to her and kind of haunting them essentially and finding ways to get revenge on them, as I said. But as the story goes on, we also kind of see the undoing of Tomie where her personality is stripped away and she turns more into this hard, calloused, 
person who doesn't seem to have any kind of boundaries on who she's harming, like for instance, in uh, the chapter with um, the man who takes her up on a mountain and tries to kill her, and then she goes after that man's brother, even though the brother has done nothing against her. She just wants revenge. And there were quite a few stories where it seemed like there was no threat. It seemed like there was no connection to that original scene in chapter one. She's just, at this point, you know, at the beginning, she doesn't want to be called a monster. Really, throughout the entire book, she doesn't want to be called a monster. Um, she doesn't want to be villainized. She doesn't want to be looked down on. And then she's becoming that monster with how with the stuff that she's doing. There were certain things that I, you know, at first when we realized that she's regrowing and then when she's chopped up, then that means that, you know, the two sides of her regrow that I'm like, okay, then there must be a hundred of these around because she's been cut up a couple times by now and the different body parts were hit all over in chapter one. So there better be a lot more Tomies than what we're following right now. But the scope just gets wider and wider and we start to see that yes, there are. Um, I started making connections really quickly about the word monster causing her wrath, or I mean, ca causing her growth to accelerate, um, you know, the burning stuff, the, the connections for that were pretty easy to make that, that burning her is the one way to actually destroy Tomie, uh, but anything that isn't burned, life will grow up from it and another Tomie will appear. There were so many connections from the beginning and so many connections all throughout it of this girl who, uh, who was killed and brutalized and, um, and this callousness, this, well, it was her fault. Well, she's terrible. No one will miss her. And like really blaming her for this and then her seeking revenge and then slowly becoming less and less of herself and more and more of a monster herself was just, it was very compelling. It was a very compelling unraveling to watch. Oh, and really interesting connections like the fact that she at first allows herself to be photographed by the girl um, who was photographing people and then selling those photographs to her friends and being dishonest. Anyway, um, she allowed herself to be photographed by that girl, but then what she saw that the photo, that the, the photo actually captures the true essence of what she is, from there on, throughout the rest of the book, she still wants to be painted and sculpted and all these things and have her beauty praised, but she no longer will allow herself to be photographed. And those little threads that carried over into each story that just um, showed her character evolving and changing and learning despite this being a new Tomie, they clearly keep the threads of, of the information of the old Tomies and the knowledge of who they've been with and what they did, like in the one where that man was carrying around her disembodied head and she had him take her to the, uh, to the jewelry store and to nice restaurants. And then a new Tomie, one that he did not do that stuff with, she remembers those things and she can recount them and she can impersonate the other Tomie, which added really interesting layers to her character as well. There were also a lot of mannerisms that I found really interesting about her. She's this femme fatale. She's this um, succubus, siren type character. She's kind of a combination of a lot of things. And yet the way Junji Ito wrote her was very interesting because really she's not seducing hardly anybody in the story. She's not, I mean, there. she's not, as far as physical contact goes, the most she ever did was kiss and she really didn't even kiss very many people. For the most part, she had this very off-putting, um, superior bratty attitude, but people were still drawn in by this force that she carried with her. And, and she kind of rejected a lot of people, like telling them, oh, go do this for me, buy me this, kill that person for me, burn that other version of me. And then whenever they said, great, can I have a reward now? Can, like, can we be together now? And her response is, no, why would I wanna be with someone as repulsive as you? I also find it really interesting that not only was she trying to get revenge or trying to punish or just in, in general, I just think that she had, she just had a lot of love in harming people. I mean, she, she loved causing distress for people, whether it be the men that were obsessed with her or going to, you know, that man's girlfriend and saying, he's cheating on you with me or whatever. She loved causing emotional turmoil. She loved 
harming people. But not only that, not only did she have that, but she did not want other Tomies to exist. And she regularly charged her obsessive um, people to burn the other versions of her so that they could be destroyed, not bury, not, you know, do anything that could cause more regrowth, multiplication. She understood her own boundaries, but specifically to burn them so that she could be the only one. And that, of course, all comes to a head when, in near the end, whenever she, um, basically, it's this town full of hers because of that one fella who was injecting blood and babies, horrifying, but, uh, you know, this town full of hers, and it's like this battle royale, except that they're not trying to kill each other. They're charging these men to kill each other. And it's just this, this intense, I must be the only Tomie, yet there really is no escaping Tomie. She's, she's too all over the place. There is no end to her. Another really interesting thing about her character is that she doesn't just have this force and this pull on her uh, that men naturally respond to, but there are men that don't respond to her. Um, sometimes it's, you know, the youngest ugly brother that just doesn't have any interest in her. Sometimes it's someone who's in love with someone else and doesn't want to, just doesn't have any interest. And instead of leaving those men alone, she becomes obsessive and fixated on them and must win them over to her. And this idea that someone could reject her is just all consuming to her. And she turns into the obsessor and she turns into the pursuer, still trying to maintain that aloof mentality, but she can't go unloved, which I just, I just, I find that so fascinating. Anyway, one story that I think was an add-on, because I don't see very many people talking about this one, uh, one story is the one that I, I mentioned of the youngest brother. There's, there's these, these four brothers, and three of them are quite attractive, and one of them is not. And Tomie comes into their life, and the three brothers argue over her and, and want her, and the youngest brother doesn't, so she fixates on him. And Anyway, long story short, if you don't have the deluxe edition, if this is only in the deluxe edition, which I don't even know if that's true, he, she chases after him, he cuts off her fingers in order to make her let go of him when she grabs a hold of him, but the fingers fall into his pocket, he has the fingers with him. And he doesn't really know who Tomie is or any of the lore around her. He's just grossed out by having her fingers and he has a fire in front of him, so he just chucks those fingers into the fire. The fingers burn up, the fire turns to ash, Ash, and then he scoops up that ash and discards it. And from those ashes, four more Tomies are born, the four fingers that were burnt to a crisp, that were burnt up. Not even like, they weren't even still nubs left. They were nothing but ash. Yet Tomie grew up from them. And this, this chapter, it, it, it drives me wild because I didn't see any other instance of, Jun, of Junji Ito not fulfilling his promises or breaking his own rules. And this is such a clear and blatant breaking of his rules, unless I'm dumb and I've missed something. And if that's the case, please do chat with me about it in the comments because you'll put me out of my misery. But it's, it's established and confirmed multiple times in multiple chapters that burning is the single way to kill her. And not only does she also say that, but other people do it and it works. And yet in this one isolated chapter, it's not. And I don't understand it. It really bothers me because I think that this story is so well told. And I think that things come together so nicely. And then this one chapter, it just doesn't. I also was a little bit disappointed with the ending. Again, I have the deluxe version. I don't know what version you've read, but at least in the deluxe version, and I don't know, maybe this is in all the versions, but at least in the deluxe version, the way the story ends is with um, this man who's injecting babies with, Tomi with Tomie's blood and a bunch of Tomie's appear and they all have this big face off. And this man who was a previous victim of Tomie's, he, he's now obsessed with maintaining Tomie, one of the Tomie's, and keeping her alive so that she will grow old, so that she will 
you know, lose her beauty and lose her power and she will suffer in the only way that he can think to make her suffer. So he charges one of the girls, one of the siblings of one of the Tomies, to protect Tomie and to um, keep her till she's old so that he can see her suffer. And, okay, one of my favorite stories, one of my favorite chapters, was of the older couple that kept adopting girls and the girls kept dying. And um, then Tomie falls into their lap and they have her and they love her. And the big twist of that story was that the maid was poisoning the girls all along and the maid wanted to be the adoptive daughter. So she was poisoning the girls so that she could manipulate her way into the family. And I thought that was such a good twist. And with this final story, things had already started to kind of peter off for me a little bit because I felt like, I felt like for quite a few chapters, I had learned all I needed to know about Tomie. I had learned her secrets. I had learned her weaknesses. I had learned what drives her. And I had seen, you know, a dozen scenarios of all these things happening. And then it just kind of felt like I was experiencing the same character doing the same basic things just in different settings, different scenarios, and I was kind of losing steam a little bit. And I did the same thing with Uzumaki as well, where there was a point where I was like, okay, I get it. I've experienced the story. I've experienced the spirals. I've experienced the horror. Now we're just doing the same thing in different scenarios. But the ending ended up coming together in such a big and satisfying way that I, it blew me away. So with Tomie, when I started to do that again, I was like, yes, okay, no problem. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm ready for the big thing that will, you know, tie it together and make it a satisfying end. And so when we were into this last bit of the story and this girl was trying to, uh, pr was trying to protect Tomie, trying to keep her safe, trying to keep, get her old, and, and when Tomie ends up taking over a mansion, taking over a manor, and, uh, and she ends up turning her sister into the maid and, and forcing her to serve her, and she's clearly getting older. I thought that the sister looked very similar to the maid from that other uh, chapter of the maid that was poisoning the girls. And so in my mind, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is it. This is the big ending. The the old lady from that chapter is old Tomie. And that's why that old lady was taking on these girls to, what does she say, to remind me of my glory days, which is such a terrible reason to have a child and to need a young girl in your home to raise is to remind you of the glory of what you once were. That's like, that's a really twisted, warped thing and it doesn't make this old lady look good at all. But then I'm thinking, oh, that old lady was Tomie. That old lady was Tomie in her in her oldness. And the reason she was doing this was because she was she was searching for this, and that's why she was trying to suck the youth out of the girls, because she's not a good woman, and like all these things, and the maid is the sister, and no. They encased her in cement and then she got free out of a crack, and Tomie lives on. But Tomie would live on anyway because we haven't gotten rid of all the Tomies because there are still Tomies out there. So like Tomie lives on still would have been a thing even if it had been that the old lady was Tomie and it comes back around to that and and it and it turns out that that was that was the one Tomie that did get tortured but then like in the window you see that there are more that are continuing on because there is no satisfying Tomie there is no there is no truly even though one was captured there is truly no end to her you know what i mean like that's that's the ending that i thought we were getting but instead it was just kind of like the end it didn't feel like it tied things together well. I may have missed something. I really have a lot of faith in Junji Ito, like a lot, after just these two books. So there is a part of me that's left just thinking, did I misunderstand? Did I miss something? Did I, did two pages stick together? Because it feels like the story just ended. It didn't feel like there was a climax. It didn't feel like there was a thing that, that, I don't know, that tied things together, that brought it all to an end. It just felt like, and here was another chapter that felt like a short story, and now it's over, and anyway, Tomie, Tomie lives on, which she would have done anyway, but yeah, 
that that one too. Do you know what I mean? I don't know how to explain it. It just, it didn't hit me like I thought the end of this would based off of the way the end of Uzumaki did, which it's not fully fair to compare the two because they're totally different stories. They were written at different time in Ito's life. So expecting one to do the same as another is unfair, but I just expected some cohesion and some climax and some punch at the end of this. It's instead of just, I don't know, it just felt like it was kind of a fizzed out ending instead of an intentional, intense, here's your ending. Does that make sense? Even with that being true, I still am left loving this story. Like, a big time loving this story. I loved Tomie's character. I loved this really unique take on the femme fatale character type. I loved the way her her plot as Tomie progressed and how her character changed and how her brutality got so much more intense. I loved so much about this story. I am disappointed with the ending, but not in any way that would ruin the story for me. Let me get into final thoughts really quick. So final thoughts, I loved this story. It's hard for me to say what I love more. I think I loved the first half of Tomie more than the first half of Uzumaki, but I loved the second half of Uzumaki more than the second half of, of Tomie. But I loved them both. I thought both were phenomenal. I'm buying more of Junji Ito's books. I'm going to read more of his next spooky season or whatever I feel like it. It. I have had a blast reading his stories. He's an author that I'm excited to read a lot of his work. I definitely recommend it. I think that it's a really fresh and interesting take on this femme fatale character, and I think it was, I, I, I enjoyed myself reading it so much. I would love to continue chatting with you about this in the comments. If you haven't read it, do you plan to? If you have, please do spoiler space, 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 so we don't spoil anybody that hasn't read it, but I'd love to discuss it some more with you, especially those two chapters, the ending and then that one other chapter. If you've read them, if you have the deluxe edition and it's only in the deluxe, I don't know. I would love to continue chatting with you about them. What it's, what's your take on these things? I post videos every Tuesday through Friday. I'll see you again soon. Bye.